the power of consistency and iterations is the name of the game. You hear it all the time. Yeah. And I, again, it's competition is in, is in the head, really, not in the market. Yeah. yeah. You feel it in your head. What, say, elaborate on that, please. And you know how you always hear in movies the American dream, like there's a Scarface, the overarching <laughs> message of that classic movie is the American dream. I'm sorry, there's a Saudi dream as well. Tomorrow, seven years ago, and that's crazy. Seven years ago, I couldn't go to the nearest grocery store to get milk on my own. Now I have my own company in Saudi. I run a business. How crazy is that leap? What we provide at Stuck is a blend of both. So we blend AI and human intelligence to provide language services that actually work. Being in touch with what you want and who you are really helps you find your roots. And all I could think of was, do I buy the bag? Do I start a business? And I took that exact amount of money and I literally went looking for someone to help me build an app. I feel like it would have been different if you had reached out to these people. No, no, I didn't, because you gave me the opportunity to discover who it was you were. Interesting. When people show you who they are, believe them. Yeah, believe. At an altitude of thirty-seven thousand feet, we soar, with a rich legacy of honoring our guests and a unique style that has resonated with the world for seventy-eight years. We carry the name of our country on every journey and across every sky. We are Saudi. We welcome you in our own way. We shape our present and build our future. Saudia, our name and country, our style and approach, striving for excellence in everything we do. This is how we fly. I feel like when, especially with social media, I mean, in the past, people didn't really see into other people's lives. So it was only what they were allowing you to see. But now with social media, you're very much involved into everybody's lives. So you feel like there's this continuous feel that you're behind or this person is doing that. I'm behind, you know, I'm late. And I think competition is not really in the market. It's really in the founders or the entrepreneur's head or whoever has a business, they're running something, it's in their head. Um, it, it's how they look at themselves and perceive themselves in comparison to others, but it's, it does not necessarily need to be the fact or the reality of it. I was in Eastern Province, Saudi Arabia, at Ithra, uh, the Aramco Museum, and they had a summit called Sync Summit, and they had some names there that I only of people that I only read books of, for example, Mo Godet, oh, yeah. uh, Kevin I met Kelly, him a few times, and um, and they were on panels that I was moderating, and we were talking about the digital paradox of the social media era. Mm. Is it good? Is it not? The the pros and cons, and you know, there are days where I think to myself you know what, it's the best time to be alive with the tech at our fingertips is unbelievable. It's scary you know, too. It, very scary. And then, and then there are some days where I just find myself having burnt 40 minutes just like that on Instagram. It's passive content as well. And you can't control what's going into your head at one point. It's just like you're consuming so much energy other people's energies as well so some energies are good for you some aren't and at one point it's very difficult for you to decipher like to differentiate between them
But th does that scare you when you look at the up and coming generation where they grow up in a world where this is the standard? It terrifies me. I look at my children and I worry. I worry about how what this will do to their mental health. I see it firsthand now. I see how they weigh people and value people uh, and how many followers they have. And, and this is a conversation we have at home. They come to me and they're like, look at him. He has like, I don't know how many million followers. And I'm like, that does not necessarily mean he's successful. Um, I mean, success is, um, well, you, you can have, look at it very differently. It's very subjective. Um, but with this generation, they definitely look at specific things. They look at numbers. They look at reach. The, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they look at value. And this is something that terrifies me. And I don't know how we can fix that. I think we're in it too deep. I was worried that my son will be in, in an environment or in a school where, in an environment where the most popular kid in class will be the one with the most Instagram followers. And, and it's looking that that's going to be the reality of the situation. In, in my era, in, in, in 1990, when I was in first grade and I was seven years old, 1991, the most popular kid in class was the one who was best in football. Mm. I had a bit of popularity because I was a goalie and nobody wants to play goalie. Mm -hmm. And I was an okay goalie. I played it all, all my life. And, and that's why I was not bullied. I was accepted. I was on the cool kids table at lunch. Mm. Now I think the cool kids table at lunch are going to be the ones with the most Instagram followers. And that is pathetic. It's a popularity contest. And the problem is they get to become center of attention. But I think if a person is not really careful with what fame and popularity does to them, it can mess them up. And so what you're trying to put on the table is a really popular messed up person. Hmm. And then everybody loves this person or they perceive him as really successful. And I think one problem with that is that, especially now with children, or maybe, maybe us as adults as well, when you look at someone's success or perceived success, you feel like it's too late for me to start or how can I get there this fast, you know? Maybe it's better for me not to start. This is out of my league. And it scares people into starting their ventures or taking a leap because they feel like they can't keep up. Um, so this is, I think that's the danger of, of social media. It's the continual comparison. Yeah. yeah. You know? But I mean, I, I think it was uh, the founder of LinkedIn who once said, if you're not I can't remember his name. If you're not embarrassed by your first product, hmm. then you've started too late. And I think this is something we all need to remember. And everyone's first product or first iteration sucks. Oh, of course. It has to. I mean, if you know everything when you first start, how, how, how is it your first start? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. I remember when we started at the beginning, the first product we had was a mess. It was a tech mess, but you know, you keep pushing, you keep, you, you test the markets, you see if there's demand because you believe in something, you see value down the road. And this is what you look at. You don't look at what you have right now. You you look at what you're going towards. Mm -hmm. And I think this gives you direction. And it's funny because it's, it's relative, right? At the time you think that it's the best thing that the internet has ever seen. And then you look back on it a year, two, three, four later, and it's, uh, it's cringe on toast. But it's your journey. And I think you own that journey and that's what makes it beautiful. You see progress. The quote was, if you are not willing to look stupid or silly, yeah. you're likely n n never gonna build anything worthwhile. It, the first iteration has to be laughable at. Yeah. Yeah. Or brought into question. Or and God knows we've been silly so many times. Absolutely. I know I have. <laughs> I know I have. I have too. <clears throat> Very remarkable story that you have. And I, and I love these stories because it's a testament to the times of Saudi, mm -hmm. how, and correct my timeline if it's wrong, but your first early days in Saudi were, were 17 years ago? Yes. 17, 17 years, years ago. ago. And I couldn't have dreamed that I'd be where I am today. So you you hail from the beautiful country of Egypt, Umm mm -hmm. and you came to Saudi 17 years ago to teach English. And you were heavily restricted or your levels of, of freedom to operate, be it in the workplace, be it in society, were nothing like what it's like today. 
And you know how you always hear in movies the American dream, like Scarface, the overarching <laughs> message of that classic movie is is the American dream. I'm sorry, there's a Saudi dream as well. There is, isn't there? I mean, I feel like I am, honestly, I feel like I am living proof that the Saudi transformation is real. And that's something I have to say, because if you think about it, Mo, seven years ago, and that's crazy, seven years ago, I couldn't go to the nearest grocery store to get milk on my own. You know, I had to get an Uber, call a driver, or ask my husband to take me. Now I have my own company in Saudi. I run a business. How crazy is that leap? And it's not only that it has happened, it has happened right. And I think this is, this is the key here. So yes, the pace has been fast, but it hasn't been at the cost of, you know, regulations or sustainability. And I think this is something that's really admirable. I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed. It's not something, well, I, I don't think I ever dreamed of starting a business or owning a company, even when I was young and like 15 and 17, when you have all those big dreams, I wasn't the kind of person who wanted to create something big. I always liked simple, small, contained things. I was more like Meg Ryan and uh, You've Got Mail, the shop around the corner. That's very much my vibe. The local bookshop? Yes, yeah, yes. And then all of a sudden, an opportunity presents itself. And I've learned to trust um, roads that take you places as opposed to being behind the steering wheel and, and you know, in control of the direction. And because if I really sit down and think about um, the big milestones in my life, most of them, I'd say all of them comfortably, all of them were things that did not go as planned. In fact, they went the exact opposite <laughs> direction from what I had initially pr planned, including coming to Saudi. And it was the best, and these were the best decisions or the best milestones that I've hit. And I think there is this power to letting go. So yes, I, I am living evidence that there is progress and the progress is sustainable and it makes sense and that there's value in the change. Um, it's, it's insane. It's insanely good. Power of letting go of what? Sorry. Direction. Hmm. So you're not continuously in control. There are so many decisions that I made in my life and they never really happened or materialized. And what happened was the exact opposite and it proved to be the best thing for me. And so I think with time, I learned to trust in that direction that sometimes, you know, you, you let go, you go with the flow and it takes you somewhere that you didn't expect. Um, and I think that's the beauty of the journey. So going from coming to Saudi 17 years ago, um, my husband um, said, we're going to come here for a couple of years. He had a project, you know, and I was like, promise me it's only two or three years, you know. And it was, yes, I promise. And today it's been 17 years and I wouldn't go anywhere else. It's home. And, um, and that's, that's letting go. That's adapting and trusting in, in the times and, and how things will change for you. How did you persevere under such limiting conditions? Um, it was very different from Egypt. But there were beautiful things about Saudi even back then. Um, I loved the slow pace of life, um, the family vibe. Um, I felt like you could do so much in one day, which is not something you can do back home in Egypt. Um, because, so, of, because of traffic? Because of traffic and because of the fast-paced life. And there's so much that is required of you and expectations as well. So here you're more yourself. And I loved that. Uh, it gave me time to to look into what I wanted, and I think my journey started as a as a teacher even before I came to Saudi. Uh, and then I joined the British Council, went from teacher going up to like senior teacher, academic manager, and then I was head of English at one of the universities here in partnership with the British Council. And I thought I had my entire life planned out, and I knew where I was going. And then COVID hit, and then the office closed down, and things completely changed. But I mean. Um, it was quite an adaptation at the beginning, and it helps when you have a partner who helps you navigate this. Um, if you are comfortable in your own small circle, you can do lots of things comfortably. Um, and I think this helps, especially with the transition. It was a new country, very different from my own, um, a new family, married life, and so a lot of new things at the same time. But I think um, being 
in touch with what you want and who you are really helps you find your roots and build towards something else. So, but the backstory is when you came here 17 years ago, you were involved in the English space with uh, an institute that teaches English. So you didn't really venture far off from what you were doing 17 years ago. The only thing different today is that you own the business and you guys have some incredible accounts uh, here in Saudi, one of which is a Giga project, which maybe you want to get into. And um, I just right off the bat, maybe I should have started with this, want to thank you for really expediting how much more efficient we are in producing episodes because the slowest thing was translation. So my point is without going on this on this crazy rant that if it wasn't for you guys, I would not be able to produce the episode in, in such quick succession uh, as we are as we are now, which takes a lot of stress off our shoulders. So thank you. جديد اكسر الروتين مع اطباقنا الجديده من بيتزا هات جده بيتزا هات جده ذو طعم ثقه معنا ثانك يو اند ثانك يو فور برينغ ذس اب اند اي مين هيرينج يو سي ذات از جاست I don't know what, how to describe it because that's exactly what we were trying to do and what we ventured into. And so it's not only about speed, it's also about quality. And I think AI has changed so much and there's this drive and move towards AI. So I have an AI company and I understand um, the value of AI in expediting certain things, but I also still value human and you know how people come in with their language nuances and cultural references and you still need that and I think what we provide at Stuck is a blend of both so we blend AI and human intelligence to provide language services that actually work because AI the way it is today it only takes you so far and even with the progress that's happening it is going to continue improving but there is something behind language that is more of a soul than just words on paper or on a screen. Yeah. And this needs to come through. And up until today, I still do not believe that this will come through without human interference. So the human component to our business model is integral, but our AI is what gets us through, what helps us scale. And this is, and, and I think this equation was honestly the perfect blend uh, given the situation and the AI or the tech ecosystem that we're in right now. So thank you for saying that. And I really appreciate it. I mean, but it's just, I mean it. it's just, you know, it, it makes it makes sense now, because when I first started the business, it was all about wanting to create value to the community that I was part of. And I come from a background of language. I graduated from Oxford University. I worked at the British Council. So it was, it was all language oxford yes i did my master's degree there so i'm not yeah no 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 don't 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 go there i don't care i don't care if you did a summer program in oxford it was was an insane experience and i think coming from this sort of background and being so entirely submerged in language and at the same time when we were working when i was working at the british council we ran corporate accounts so i knew what companies were going through the kind of needs they had but I wasn't doing it from a language service perspective. It was more from speaking, public speaking, uh, you know, meetings and, and having people speak the language, English at the time. And then um, I slowly got, so I had an idea and it slowly started materializing. And then I realized that people also needed Arabic, people like me who were very comfortable speaking in English and Arabic, but when they had to write, their Arabic would take disaster. them in a completely different direction. Writing is the hardest. Yes, and it uh, doesn't sound like me, uh, you know. So you write something in Arabic. You you would probably know how to write in Arabic, but it just does not sound like Mo. Mm, it does true. not reflect your voice, right? Uh, absolutely not. And that's when I felt like, okay, English language support, Arabic language support. That's a market that is underserved, and that's a market I want to focus on. That's when you got the idea of stuck question mark. <laughs> stuck question mark. Yeah, but I mean, the way it happened wasn't that way. So 
I think we have like an interesting story of, of how the business uh, started. As I told you, I never really wanted to, to build a company or to create some sort of venture. But um, I was working at the British Council, COVID hit, the office in Jeddah closed down. And I'm not really mobile uh, because of my family, they're here. So I was like, okay, where do I, what do I do with my life? I, I need to start looking for a job. And when I did, I got plenty of very interesting offers really, but I just did not see myself working there. It's not that the place was, wasn't good, it's just that I could not envision myself in that place. And so I took time off and focused on my music for a while. And I started teaching piano online, which was hilarious, but it worked. And, um, and everything was online during COVID. And I had always had this idea that I wanted, so mind you, this is pre-AI and pre-GPT. I wanted to build an app that would help people with language on the go. So the app would function similarly to Uber, but instead of booking a ride, you book a language expert. So this was the idea, and that's why it's called stuck with a question mark. Stuck, we help you say it. And um, I knew nothing about technology or like an app. How does that start? How do I start? Where do I start from? I, I wasn't very tech savvy either. So um, I thought, you know, yeah, that's a really cool idea. I told my friends about it. They were like, oh, it's my, yes, that's, that's really good. Everybody needs it. But then I didn't know how to start, so I let it go. And then I remember I went to Dubai on holiday and um, I went to the Dubai mall and I wanted to buy it back. And the amount of money I had in my bank account, because I had been out of work for a while, was the exact same amount that would buy me this bag that I wanted. And I took a picture that day because it was the, like it was a changing moment in my life. I stood there with the bag in the store, looking in the mirror with a mask on. And my friend was sitting there saying, oh, man, do it. I mean, you owe it to yourself. You've been, you know, trying so hard. And all I could think of was, do I buy the bag? Do I start a business? Do I buy a bag? Do I start a business? And then I remember the guy coming to me and saying, do I wrap it up for you? And I'm like, no. And I put it back on the shelf. And I took that exact amount of money. And I literally went looking for someone to help me build an app. I didn't know where to start from. And this was the beginning. So we built an MVP. And we launched an MVP to just test demand to see if people really needed these services. You know, they needed English language support for their translation, for their content writing, Arabic language support. And there was demand. The demand was insane, but the technology wasn't helping me because it was really, really dodgy. <clears throat> so um, just a few months in, uh, we kept trying to push, to push through. And then we got into an accelerator program, 500 Global. Um, and it was a really powerful start. And I think maybe just a couple of months into launching our MVP, a big company came to us and they were like, we have a music curriculum and we've gone everywhere to try to translate it and nobody could. And they were like, can you do this? And the funny thing is, I'm a musician, so I'm, I'm a classically trained pianist. So I knew what this was about. And, and I think this was, this was luck. This was it is really. So they came to us with an entire curriculum with the Ministry of Culture. And they were like, we need this translated. And I said, okay, hold, let's try one chapter. And we did one chapter and then we signed an entire contract. And at that point, I'm like, okay, B2B. We're going to switch into B2B. <clears throat> Sorry. But um, that was the beginning and it was... It was insane. And now we work with lots of companies, major companies here in Saudi, um, big accounts. And I'm very proud with what we've achieved. And again, it's the blend of AI and human that is getting us where we are. I think it's more common than not to not have self-control. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. You know where I'm going. Yeah, I do that with food. I used to do that with cars. That's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm proud to say that it's been two years and two months that I'm with the same car and ask anyone who knows me, That's including my sisters who you are friends with, yeah. they'd be like, okay, this is a new person that we're looking at now. Yeah. So I know 
the temptation of if you want something and you have the means, go for it. Yeah. Now I channel all my energy into this. But it's it's the kind of instant gratification that we instant were looking for. And I think this is something that we learn the hard way. It doesn't really work. It's, it is instant, but it's temporary. And, and I think maybe now that you're here and you started doing the podcast, you see the value of what you're doing. You see how amazing you're doing in different parts of the world and how your voice is resonating in different countries. And I think this is when you start thinking, okay, so it is really working when I say I'm not going to spend on this and I'm going to spend on something else because there is a dream that you're following. You know, there's, there's a goal. And I think this makes a lot of difference. The car touches one person, maybe two, maybe my wife cares, maybe she doesn't. Maybe my kids care, maybe they don't. But with the podcast, I think we, we touch a f you know a few more people than 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 just those, and that was the aha moment, the the light bulb. A lot more people. Uh, and again, it's not only when you. I mean, in your situation, it's amazing because yes, you are reaching an incredible number of like people. But um, even with young people who want to start the business, they can still serve a smaller community or a smaller circle and it would still be valuable absolutely and um and even if it serves you mm. you yourself alone but it makes sense uh, then it's worth waiting for and it's i think instant gratification is something that we really <laughs> all need to work on this was four years ago the story when you put the bag back on the shelf uh two and a half years ago did you eventually ever go back and buy the bag yes the year after that so I think that was a really proud moment. Delayed gratification. Yes. You got the bag, but you also have a business and you yeah. have some more money in the bank now. So it makes sense. And, and I think that taught me so much. But um, if anything, it really um, tells people, it, it, it really helps people see that, you know, don't wait for the perfect conditions to start because it will never be perfect. I remember when we were young, um, when we, we want, when I wanted to study, I would go into my room and start tidying things up, you know, you know, in preparation for an ambiance of, of, of studying, which I would spend hours preparing my, in my room and then maybe 30 minutes studying. And I think we do that now as grownups as well. We try to create an environment that is suitable for a specific thing and we want to wait for a specific moment because we think that we need to start right. We don't need to start right. We just need to start. And then, because even if you start right, it won't be right. And there will be so many changes that you will have to make on the way. And I think, yes. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to start right. We just need to start. Mic drop. Yeah. Some of the best things I've ever heard. One of the best things I've ever heard, honestly. And that's what you did. So you, you're actually speaking from experience. Yes, first hand. And, and that's why it makes more sense. Or like, I think there's more value to it because I've lived it. And um, again, coming from a place, coming from a very non-entrepreneurial background, you know, I never really felt like I could talk about money with people. It wasn't a conversation that I would venture into being a founder, being running a company and, and getting key clients and working with major entities right now, it's starting to look very different. And it gives me the kind of confidence to say, this is what we have. We have value and we present this value to you. We would love for you to try it. And, and I think this gives us a bit more leverage and it gives me the kind of confidence that can take me one step forward. Asma, do you ever look back and wish you started earlier? And I, and I ask you that because it's something that crossed my mind and then someone would say listen just be happy that you started you know god showed you the way at the right time but you ever think if i started a year or two before where it be t where where would i be today i don't think so you don't think i that? don't think that way okay. um then you're, you're in a better place than, than than i am mental health but, because i sometimes think if only i started a year early. but i mean think about what you do in podcasts and think about podcasts two years before you actually started I don't think a lot of people would 
knew what a podcast was, maybe especially here in the region, maybe abroad things were different. But here it wasn't that common. People are now really engaging with true, podcasts true. and, and you were looking at numbers. 2018, I, it, it started to make a name for itself. I started yeah. in 2020. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's also about how prepared you were mentally and, you know, your family as well. Because when you start a business, you don't start it alone. True. Everybody starts that business with you because it takes up your time. I've always liked the idea of going to work and finishing at, I don't know, four or five and switching off. I felt it gave me the space to create and to do what I wanted with the rest of my time. Now that I have a company and run a business, I can't switch off. It's there constantly, and especially that I'm in tech. Tech is really fast paced. Every single day I wake up in the morning and I have to look and see, okay, who created what? Who's going where? You know, where will I be able to, is this the same direction that I'm going? Am I going to leverage this technology? Am I going to let it go because it does not go in line with my ethics? That's also something you need to think about every single day in the tech industry. So I think everything happens in its own good time and it's not cliche. It's because you are prepared. It is the right time for you. So no, I think it was good. I needed the two years off to really figure out that, you know, get in a nine to five job was no longer going to work. Yeah. Any moments in business that have humbled you? Every single client who comes back to us and says, thank you. You've created something that we are able to use and that has made a difference in the language service industry, in our lives, the way we translate, the way we write, the way we create content. This humbles me because it's just proof that we've done something right. And believe me, Mo, there were so many difficult moments along the way. And I won't be exaggerating if I tell you that the number of times in the last two years, the number of times that I decided to quit. The with, com your, your company? Yes, to close down and quit, shut down, was more than the number of times I've decided to diet. And if anybody knows me, I decide to diet every Sunday of every week. So that's a lot of quitting. But you just push through. Because there, especially when you're, you're starting a business from scratch, bottom up. And when you come from a very non-entrepreneurial background, you are face-to-face -face with conversations that you weren't prepared for. When I started a startup, I didn't know what a startup was or an ecosystem. I didn't understand what fundraising was, but everybody was doing it, so I need to do it. And then I started having conversations and fundraising. I mean, alhamdulillah, now we are doing great. We're fundraising. We're very close to closing our round, and I'm very happy. But when, when I first started, it wasn't like that. I wasn't comfortable talking about money. I remember... I mean, I find it difficult to go up to my husband or back then when I was younger to my father to ask for money. I would expect them to sense that I need money. I'd expect them to give me the money and I would get upset if they didn't, but I wouldn't go ask for it. So imagine how it felt for me. Pride? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. Now that you say that. Yes, maybe. But it was very difficult for me to go up to a complete stranger and say, hey, I have a business. You know, we're fundraising. Mm. It was very difficult. It was a conversation I wasn't prepared for. And the first couple of times I tried, because everybody around me was trying, um, I didn't get the kinds of responses I was expecting. And it broke me more than anything, because we were just talking, you and I, about starting a business and how it's your baby and you get attached to it. So imagine investing so much time and effort into something and you see value in it. And you try to you know, communicate that to someone, but then they go like, oh no, that's not for us. It was really hard. Shattering. Very. But I was not prepared. One thing I did, I have this tiny office. In the office, there's nothing except a desk and a chair. And after these conversations, early on, when we were fundraising a long time ago, not now, I would get disheartened and it would kill me when people rejected certain conversations. And I bought a yoga mat. I don't do yoga. I bought this thick yoga mat and I put it on the floor because I needed to lie down and curl into myself and grieve a lost opportunity just for a little while, for like 10, 15 minutes, get up again and work. And that's the one thing that has kept me going. That's so healthy. Because I was told to not care. How can I not care? It didn't make sense to me. 
You know, how can I not care? If, if, if you come up to someone and say, hey, I have this thing for you and I know you love it. And they go like, no, we don't. How are you not going to care? People kept telling me, it's okay. Just, you know, it's not personal. It's business. But it was personal to me. So at the beginning, it took me weeks to get over a disappointment. And then I realized that was really unhealthy and it was affecting me and affecting everyone around me. So I decided, okay, we're going to try something different. We're going to grieve a lost opportunity for a few minutes, let myself feel what I wanted to feel, get up again and work. Because to get somewhere, and this is something that I've learned the hard way, to get somewhere, you need to do it consistently, like you were just saying before the show, day in and day out, regardless of how you felt about it. You had a good day, you'd work. You had a bad day, you'd still work. It was disappointing, you'd still work. I lost a partner. I still had to go to work and, and do the job. And then, you know, things worked out. And I think it's then that you start seeing value in, in all the things that you, you've been through. And now I feel more prepared to have a conversation about money. So now we, when I talk to investors, I see things differently. I see that we have value and we're presenting that value to them. And if they're interested and if they're the kind of strategic investors or partners that I would want for myself, then great. But at the beginning, it didn't feel like that to me. It was more like, oh, can you help me grow? Now I feel like, no, we're sustainable. We're a good business. We can carry on on our own. We might not be able to scale as quickly if we don't have the right kind of funding, but we're not going to die. And I think this gave me a bit more confidence and, and readiness to like handle rejections as well. Micro mourning, I think it's healthy. That's the first reaction. The second reaction I have is you shifted the way you feel about yourself from this is my world, this is my universe. Do you really not see value in it too? But I'm not for everyone. Oh my God, yes. And that, I, I said that, those, not, that's my I'm not 100% there yet, though, because I still, I'm pretty sure you would understand that you would still have your moments of, oh, but maybe if I had changed this in my business model, this, you know, strategic investor would have come in or, or this client would have agreed to sign with us. Um, but confidence is tenfold. 100%. That, that, that's where I wanted to, that's where I wanted to, like, really, that's the pressure point I wanted to touch on. Yeah. Your confidence is tenfold. So whatever the hell else happens, I don't care. Confidence is everything. It's all about how you walk into a room. Yes, and it's how, how much you believe in what you're doing and the value that you're providing or producing. Um, because trust me, when you're still early on in your journey, a lot of people come to you with advice and tips and, and sometimes you need these people. So sometimes you're ready to change specific things to like fit uh, to fit a mold or to get, to, to take a box. And um, I'll tell you something. Um, close to six months ago or so, uh, I had a conversation with an investor and it was an investor I really wanted. And we had been talking for months and I felt like he genuinely liked her business and liked me as a founder. And it's important when you sign with somebody to, to have this sort of relationship. And then it came to the last um, conversation and he was like, I said, you know what, we just need an answer. Now we need an answer. We need to like close. And he said, I love what you're doing. You're running an amazing company. I, I see the value in what you're doing. You're growing and that's amazing. But I feel like you're building this incredible BMW, but you're adding a horse just in case the engine fails. And when he said that, the horse by horse, he meant the human component to our business because we are an AI company that still has like a human component to it because I feel like this is what the market needs. And he was pro complete and full automation. And this was, this was his problem. And I, and I heard that and it hurt me. You're building an amazing BMW, but you're adding a horse just in case the engine fails. It was offensive because humans, <laughs> I mean, I love horses, but it felt wrong. And, it took me off guard. It really caught me off guard. But then I was like, in all humbleness, really, but I'm trying to build a plane, not a BMW. 
And if I come to you today and I tell you, hey, Mo, get on this plane, it will take you from point A to point B, which is where you want to go. But mind you, it's fully automated. There is no pilot, no crew. You're going to be there on your own, but trust me, you're going to get there. Chances are you won't get on the plane. I mean, there are some people who would, but the majority, and we are catering to the majority, won't get on that plane. But if I come to you with the same plane, a fully automated plane, and I say, hey, this is a really good fully automated plane that will take you from point A to point B, but there's a pilot, just in case, and there are like five members of crew there to make sure that you're comfortable and reassured. Chances are you're going to get on that plane. And then the next month I can take one crew member off and, you, you know, eventually in a couple of months, you'll be able to get on a fully automated plane. And that's the market. The way I see it, I might be wrong, but the way I see it, when, because we work with businesses, we don't work with individuals. I mean, yes, you can still use the app to translate something, but our effort, our energy is going to, towards B2B. The way I see companies, they are not yet prepared for full automation. They need a pilot in the seat. Yes, yeah. yes. So you take it easy with them. And if, if I'm going, if the only thing that will get me to close a deal with you is for me to let go of part of my business model, the one that I feel is working for companies. Mo, well, we have zero churn, which means that every single company that has subscribed to our platform when we first launched is still a subscriber today. That's huge. For a tech company, yes, and I'm very proud, alhamdulillah. So what I'm trying to say is there is value. And so if, as a young entrepreneur or like a new one, you would feel inclined to changing things to fit or to, 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 for people to like you or like investors to like you. I mean, it's okay to pivot. It's okay to change. That's part of the journey, but not entirely, especially if you believe in it. Agreed. Yeah. So you said something that resonated with me big time from what I picked up in that book behind you, The 4-Hour Work Week by the great mm-hmm. Timothy Ferrison. And it was actually instrumental in me mustering up the courage to start this and see what happens with it. Not leave corporate, but start this. What I got from that book, The Silver Lining, if they, they say, uh, I don't know who it was that said, if you get one good thing out of a book, then it was a great book. Mm-hmm. Double down on your strengths. Don't work on your weaknesses. Oh, interesting. Because by the time you improve your weaknesses, you are at an average level. I knew my strengths was English. Mm. If I started an Arabic podcast, I would have been submerged in a sea with, you know, 200 other podcasts. Mm. Sure, sure as hell wouldn't have gotten Princess Rima on if I was an Arabic podcaster. Yes. But, but you know, it, it escaping competition through authenticity, doubling down on my strengths which is what you say you did. You asked Mm -hmm. yourself that question, right? Mm -hmm. You said, what are my strengths? Yeah. What am I good at? What am I good at? Yes. I asked myself, what are my strengths? Same, same thing. Yes, exactly the same thing. And you use that as leverage. Yes. And it puts you in a position of power because you know what you're doing and, and you don't feel like you need to, you don't feel, you, you don't constantly feel behind because you start from an informed position because you know you're good at this you know and i think a lot of times uh, when we start ventures and we're very very detached from the idea itself um, just because we want to build a business or just because we want to generate some other source of revenue it doesn't work as well because you're not emotionally invested Mm -hmm. in this ما الحمى من نكهات الجديدة في طريقها لك مستعد؟ وصلت نكهات ليز الجديدة المانجو والتواب الحارة امسح كود الكيو ار على العبوة حمل تطبيق جوي واكسب جوائز كثيرة المسلسلات يبي لها نكهات جديدة What's something you'd never tolerate? Or that really annoys you? Judgment I really hate it when people judge. And I think we come from a very judgmental society, all of us. Hmm. Pan-Arab? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and I think, I, I, I don't know if I can say used to be judgmental, but I'm pretty sure I still am in a way. But I try to be a bit more aware of that. Um, because 
it doesn't serve anybody. It doesn't serve me if I'm judgmental. It doesn't serve the person I'm judging at all. And it's always cued. It's always cued. And I think with the past couple of years, we've seen that, you know, it's just let it go. People are different. You don't need to to expect them to behave a certain way. If you don't like something, let's just let it go. Um, but I don't, I really don't like judgment. And I think we do it a lot. I mean, I know why. It makes you feel better about yourself. It's How true. sad. True, it, it does. But it, it doesn't take you anywhere. It doesn't make you, it makes you feel better about yourself now, but you know the truth. You know that truth. you're not there, yeah. you know? Yeah. You're not good yeah. if, if this is what's uh, making you feel better. It's again, it takes us back to the same thing. Competition is in your head. If you continuously feel like you want to outdo somebody, then it's your problem. It's not theirs. And um, yeah, maybe if we just focus on what we're doing a bit more and less on what other people are doing, we would go a lot farther. So yeah, judgment is something I won't tolerate. And that's a very, very important trait because I think it, it would eventually, I mean, <clears throat> the judgiest among us, I believe there's a direct correlation between them being the least happy among us. If you're constantly judging, mm. you're not happy. Yeah, and I think the is. happiest are the ones that are living well. Yeah, I agree. And I think I'm pretty <clears throat> sure you've been through something similar to that. But for example, for me, with me being a musician and a hijabi, uh, it wasn't an easy thing. Um, you know, going on stage and people would just assume that you were just going to do something and walk down and then someone else will go off <laughs> stage. I remember this one time we were playing at a jazz festival and um, I'm the kind of person who would get nervous if I arrive too early and I keep staring at the stage and the lighting and people are not there. I would start forgetting chords and I'd always have my headphones on um, to go on stage and like try to, you know, reassure myself that I know that I know the music. So there was this one time when I arrived really early, nobody was there except the security guards. And um, I was staring at the piano on stage and I'm trying to like relive what I'm gonna play. And all of a sudden I realized that I forgot what key it was in. So I got on stage, sat at the piano, put my headphones on, plugged it in so nobody would hear and tried to remember. And then uh, the security guard, uh, the security guy came up to me and he's like, can you please get off? There's a band coming now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I was like, he was doing his job. He thought, Haram, he was doing his job. He thought someone was going up and like going to mess up, mess with the gear. Don't tell me you got shooed away. So he was like, no, not a, not in an impolite way, but he was like, there's a proper band that's coming now, and and I I'm aware that proper. I don't look, I don't look the part, so I smiled and I didn't have time to to start to talk to him because I really wanted to get to remember the chords. So I just put my headphones back. I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. You know, and then he's like, no, 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 there is a proper band coming now. And if they see you on stage, they're going to get upset. And I just took my headphones off like I'm the proper. Band. <laughs> I wanted to say that I'm the lead musician in this proper band that you're talking about. But and I, poor thing, he, he didn't mean anything. It was he wasn't trying to be offensive. But I understand there is an image that comes with everything. And this is part of the judgment. Maybe it's not necessarily negative, but it comes with a specific image. So musicians, you'd have to look a certain way, dress a certain way, and I didn't fit the mold. Um, and so that night, you know, people came in, we performed, it was, um, it was the battle of the bands and, and we actually won. So towards the end of, uh, of the night, I was walking out with uh, my gear and then the same guy came up to me and he's like, it was so good. You killed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I don't think he's ever going to approach another hijabi who goes on stage and, and you know, Hopefully not. about to play an instrument, <laughs> whatever that instrument is. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's, part of, um, of course. it's part of the journey and being a musician. There's, there's a sort of stigma that comes with music yeah. in our, in our um, region. And... Um, so you should be really careful when you when you sure. venture into that. You, and if you're going to get into this, you need to be aware that this is going to happen True. to you. Um, so I tried to be careful with my steps into music. I tried to keep it as a hobby. 
I never really wanted to be, you know, a professional thing or like a, a job. It's not what I'm cut out for. And I like to have it as a backup, something to fall back on as opposed to like my actual, yeah. you know, world. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I've seen a lot of change happen in Saudi in the past few years. Really? Spe- like especially w- one or music. two changes or a bit more? Than a lot of changes in the music industry. Come on. When you look at m- the music industry, there are layers. Or the way I look I, at it. I was talking in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah general, but, of course. But of course, in the music industry, I mean, we never had live concerts. Yeah. At least not, not in my childhood. And like proper ones, you know. Proper ones. Yes, yes, proper. really good concerts. For, Formula One, for example. Yes, yes. But I like it how it's not just, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the crazy, loud hip-hop and all that. You'd get someone like a... Charlie Puth, his name. Yeah. You know, we, we all know his songs, and you you know you get those. Uh, I don't know if it's I don't know what kind of music would you call him, but more like alternative, laid back. Mm. So there's a bit of taste where okay, we'll give you your David Guetta's, we'll give you your Pharrell Williams, but we're also going to throw you a curveball, you know, by the name of someone called Charlie Puth. Yeah. Who yeah. killed it that yeah. night? Yeah. And Alicia Keys came as well. And Alicia Keys. It I mean, fantastic. we have a music commission. Good friend of mine, Hala, works at it. Ha- oh. Hal Al Hadethi and. There's a, there's a team, I don't know how many there are, but a couple dozen maybe. And they were in Austin, Texas a few months ago. Oh. And they're traveling and they're waving the Saudi flag when they get there and they're looking for talent and they're bringing talent back to Saudi. That's a amazing. music commission under the Ministry of Culture. Oh, trust me. But I you didn't think of that 17 years ago. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> was, music say. was very hush hush, you know. It was, hush. it was bad until it was no longer bad. But honestly, um, when I look at the music scene, there are three layers to, to the music scene. Yes. Uh, there is the the professional music scene where you get international artists or people from different countries, very, very famous musicians or singers to come and perform. And I see a huge change there. You, everybody knows this. Like people in countries very, very far away can tune in to like concerts in Saudi now. So yeah. this is an absolute change. And then there's the second layer, which is the underground music. And there's change there. But I think it will also need some more time. And there's, there needs to be a m- bit more support to the underground musicians because usually a country's uh, most creative people come from the grungiest yeah. areas or, yeah. or places. So I think this is an area that they're starting to work on as well now and supporting underground music. It will take some time. And then the, the last layer, and I think the most important, is music education. Yeah. And, wow. and this is something that needs to come into schools big time. I, I, I totally see and appreciate those three layers that you just mm-hmm. outlined. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm seeing a huge change. And I'm, I'm, we actually work on translating and content, uh, generating content for music curricula that will go into schools. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to see that. So, I mean, because if you want artists in 10 years time, they need to start now. True. It takes time. So, yeah. It's, what, it's when fantastic. I went to school in England at the age of 11, there was music class. And I was like, what? <laughs> we wouldn't have that back in Saudi. Yeah. So interesting to know that. And, and international schools in Saudi offer music classes. Yes. Interesting to know that it's something that they want to get into the curriculum uh, oh, across yes, the board. Yes. And I know big entities who are working very closely with the government to, to make this possible. And it's fantastic to see. There's a lot of research that's going on. Um, I, I Sometimes I'm part of it because I'm a musician. And sometimes I'm part of it because it comes to us to to like write or to translate. So it, I'm really happy to see this happening. And I think the, the next step would be to make this accessible to everybody. So not only, so music should be accessible to the public regardless of how much they make. Uh, it should not be something that only, you know, wealthy people can afford. Okay. It needs to be, and I think they're also going towards that, which I'm very happy to see. You know, when you said that it's, it's great to get these big names and to celebrate them and all but there's also this underground scene that can really use the support Mm. it reminded me of something that alex hermosi said when he said that we root for people who don't need it oh yeah art is not art until someone says it's art Yeah. yeah people won't clap until other people clap and this is how it's usually is and so when you're the first person to actually say Mm. This is art, then, mm. you know, you're a pioneer. Um, and I agree. Like, I agree. We support. I'm pretty sure that now the kind of support you get from people around you 
there's a lot more than the kind of support you used to get when you first started. I needed it when I just started. Exactly. You needed it most. And that's why 80% of podcasts, I can speak about my industry. Sorry mm -hmm. for making it about my industry. No, no, no. But that's it's, all I know. It's, we have that in common. 80% of podcasts don't make it beyond six episodes. So if you produce your seventh, you're in the 80th percentile. Mm. Wow. Or top 20 percentile. You are in a, in a one of five. You are one of five if you produce your seventh. Wow, that's that's an insane. That, that's that's statistics. That's scary. And, uh, but how much of that statistic is embedded in the fact that I needed your support in those first six, so I can really feel like I'm onto something special, and then it's f this because I don't think it's something special. And 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 I mean, come on, how many times did football teams end up in a position where they're losing and they tied and they won because the crowd did not give up on them? Yes, and I would comfortably say that. I believe that a lot of businesses die really, really young because it's not because they don't have the money. I think it's they don't, they no longer feel that people want them there, like people believe in them as founders. Because at the, at the early stage of starting, like you said, your podcast or a business, it all boils down to you, the, the person who's doing it. If you don't feel confident enough to keep going, how are you going to keep going? And, and that's, that's the most important phase, really, because this is where you get your grit from. And I think one thing that I love, I never interrupt, but I'm going to because I love that word. Yeah, it's, it's what you need to go. Grit. It's, it's the, I think it's the only thing that helps you go through everything you, that people blow in your face. And yeah, grit. It's, it's the it's one a, thing that a founder really needs. Yeah, it's a separator. Definitely. Mm. And it also stems from the sort of confidence that you get early on. It's very difficult to establish or to build grit without having had any sort of support at the beginning, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. People don't support um, until other people support. Yeah. And I see this every day. And we, it's sad. <laughs> we root for people who don't need it. Yes. It's yes. so simple. It's five words. We root for people who don't need it. seven words whatever <laughs> but it's so true mm -hmm. you know if you start a business it would be fantastic for people to do some sort of housewarming you know i've never heard I'll, of that and i love that idea i'll come i'll come buy something from you just because you've only started it doesn't necessarily mean i need it or what do you need to to, to make it one more month you know do you need a, a computer or do you need but what do you need asma it, it listen it you putting yourself in a position where you can potentially elevate in life can make people around you very uncomfortable. And this but this is the, the wrong people. This is the sad truth of life. And that's why I say that, you know, I went from this many people who you speak to on a day until this many. Yeah. There's just one clip that I really want to play for you by Tracy. Tracy Hermush, who's an who's an amazing oh, I, I know her. Uh, podcaster. She's really developed some incredible content, and she said something recently where I was like, "So it's not just me, huh? This is a real thing in life." Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? One second. Shout out Tracy Hermush. A lot of people love you and adore you when they don't see you as a threat when you're still so sweet and so cute and she's amazing and she's lovely and she's my best friend, that title gets thrown around left, right and center. But if that person grows a little bit of confidence, power, status, elevates completely in society, a lot of people become very uncomfortable with that. You realize that someone ends up losing friends when they're performing beyond someone else's expectations. That person that was once, oh, I love this girl or I love this guy so much, no longer becomes. Who does she think she is? She's changed. She's different. Why is she like that now? She wasn't like this before because it makes people uncomfortable. That's the reason why you end up losing a lot of friends along the way when you're moving upwards because most people like you in your place. When you're a little below them or on their level, they like you there. It makes them very uncomfortable when you're elevating. A lot of people love you. I watched that 10 times in a row the first time I heard it. <clears throat> Message yeah. to her, I was like, yo. So it's not just a sensation that I caught where 
I felt that people got a little uncomfortable because I went off the beaten path. Anyway, this Do you is feel the... like it would have been different if you had reached out to these people and not let them or allow them to decide? I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. If, if people feel uh, threatened? No. No. I didn't. Because you gave me the opportunity to discover who it was you were. Interesting. When people show you who they are, believe them. Yeah, believe them. Yeah. yeah. If, if you are not happy with what I am doing, then that tells me all I need to know about you. Um, that's true. Yes. Maybe I found my way. Maybe I think I found my way. But for you not to be around because maybe I did or maybe I didn't find my way. No. That brings everything into question. Yeah. But but now, but thank you for showing me who you are. Now I know. Yeah, Great. that's true. Yes. You wanted me over here. And she says, elevate in society. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hmm. No, 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 no. Anyway. Yeah. I think it's a sad part of life. Anything, I'm very good at this, switching subjects. <laughs> Anything missing in your life today? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, if I say... Uh, yes, I'd feel ungrateful. If I say no, I'd sound cocky. Um, I feel like there might be things that are missing in my life, but I'm okay with that. And I understand that if they're not here yet, it's not the time. So it's okay for me to wait. And um, again, it, it goes back to the same thing. When there's a, a flow, just follow it and see where it takes you. It usually takes you to the things that you uh, wanted to see. Um, and if there's anything that's missing, it could possibly be um, because I'm not working towards it as much as I as I should. Um, change happens in the work that we are avoiding. <laughs> so if I'm if I do the work that I'm avoiding every single day, I'm probably going to be in a much better place. So if I'm not in that place, it's, I don't want to say it's my fault, but I'm part of the reason why it's not there yet. That's a line to live your life by. If you think about it, it applies to everything. I think about it in business because when I first started, um, again, running, running a company, I'm, I wasn't fully aware of how to, um, do financials and you know at the beginning you don't you can't really afford to hire lots of people so you had to do things yourself and there were so many things that I would like put away just because I felt like I wasn't good at and it would just be such a burden for me to sit hours working on numbers and crunch them um, but then when I had to sit down and do that that's when I started seeing growth or like how I could do better next month so and if you take that you know, change happens and, and the work you're avoiding and you apply it to everything, like even to, to like weight loss and like getting physically fit. It's it's the, that run that you don't want to go on or that extra weight that you don't want to do. It, it applies really well, even in relationships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't you can't underscore it enough, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Again, going back to you're you're taking me back to lessons that I learned from Alex Hermosi, who said, "List all the things that you are not willing to give up. That is what the person who will beat you is willing to give up." Oh wow! <laughs> it so spoke to me that. Yeah. It so spoke to me. Yeah, yeah, and it also, you know, puts you in a place to see why certain people have achieved specific things and maybe you're not willing to give it up and you're okay with not giving it up but at least now you know this is why you haven't achieved what yeah. other you know someone else has achieved so you should be a bit more at peace with it because it's not like you know it's luck and he was lucky and i wasn't maybe you were part of the equation as well but again yeah applying it to business it's it's that's a lot to, mm. to think about and i think like you said when you're running this podcast and you know, with a journey where you started and where you're at right now. Again, I think about where I started um, and where we're at today. The lessons you learn every day, day in and day out, it's it really adds to your growth. Big time. 
Yeah. It's no longer about the mission. It's about the person. Yes. You. Yes. It, it affects you. Yeah. That's it becomes part of who you are and mm -hmm. you generally reflect. So it's it's beautiful to see. Yeah. It's yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, it teaches you a lot, a lot running a business. Is it important to have a dream? I think we um, over glorify dreams. It's important to have a goal. If you're not working towards something, it's you might feel like life is futile. And that goal can differ from one person to another. It could be, I mean, I if I go back to women and, you know, the gender bias thing, um, a lot of women choose to be stay-at-home moms, and it's a goal, and I respect that so much. But what I see is other women who go like, oh, but you don't, you're not working, or you know, you don't have like a sort your own source of income, or what if this was her goal? You know, just the fact that it's not yours does not make it less important. And um, so I think we over glorify dreams and we give them a specific shape. So a dream can be about money and success and like physical appeal or, you know, so these are dreams that people would understand and would expect you to have. And so I see lots of people who don't have these sorts of dreams and they're very happy, but they sometimes feel like there's this expectation of them to have a dream and to follow that dream and to like hit specific milestones. It's not who they are and they're okay with it. But that kind of pressure that we put, I have a feeling and I'm not really sure. I, I feel like this is a Western um, culture or a Western way of thinking that we've adopted in our region. I don't think this existed many, many years ago. The fact that, you know, you have to have a dream, you have to have a goal, you have to chase yeah. that. If, yeah, yeah. I'd agree I think with that. it's a bit, yeah, it's yeah. a bit new and um, it's part of, it's part of a trend. It, it was go to school, get married, job. Yeah. That's, that's what you are to do in society. But if you're okay with that, that's okay. No problem. No, I'm yeah. with you on that. But the whole, when I hear dream, I think the entrepreneurial route. Right. I it has a specific shape to it, you. It does. It yeah. does. Going off the beaten path. Yes. You know, you did not end up working in, in, in government as a government employee or a private sector employee. You wanted to build your own business. Mm. You wanted to be the crab that crawled out of the bucket. I attach dream more to that. Yes. Breaking than boundaries. Status quo. Yes, exactly. But if a person's dream is to have a small family, live a slow life, have quality time with their children, get a decent job that he doesn't hate, um, make some good money and, you know, be good to people around him. That's a perfectly valid dream. Because that's my, dreams are relative. And I, res I respect big dreams just as much as I respect those dreams that aren't of magnitude. Hey, that's yours. And you actually, are you happy? Hmm. That's as long as it's your choice. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, precisely. Yeah. It's I all, agree. it's all, I, I, there's no way I would respect someone more because their dreams are bigger than the other. Mm. Hey, if that got you happiness and I see the smile on your face, I will salute you for finding what made you happy, irrespective of the magnitude of what it took to get there. Mm. Yes, I agree. And again, I think um, value or happiness is not in reaching a specific point. It's, if you think about hiking, it's, it's not in getting where you want to go, it's in the trail. Right. It's being on the trail. That's the beautiful part. That's the part that's most rewarding. Journey. Um, the journey itself. And, you know, discovering the trail one step at a time, slipping sometimes, going back up. I think that's the beauty of it. And this could be, you know, this could be a dream in itself, you know, taking it one step at a time, baby steps, and seeing where it takes you. It's interesting. Not to be all cheesy, but are you living it? Are you living your dream? Um, I think I am. Hmm. Yes, I think I am. And not, I, you're not sure? Uh, not that I'm not sure. I'm so not a psychologist, <laughs> by the way. I, ju I just saw a bit, a bit of reluctancy. That's why I'm pushing back on that. A, a no, it's bit. just that, again, uh, sometimes it's overwhelming. Hmm. 
And this is the part that gets to me sometimes, you know. Again, we go back to the fact that I always like things simple, small, contained, and all of a sudden, you know, company, grow, scale, hire, get, uh, you know, generate revenue, work with this client, make him happy, work with that client, make him happy. And, and all of a sudden, there's this internal race for growth. And sometimes um, this can throw you out and it, it gets overwhelming. And if I don't keep that in check, it can take its toll on, on me and my life and the people in my life as well. So definitely I am living the dream, not because I've achieved success, but because I'm trying something, I'm venturing into something. I can see, I can see my steps materialize into something of value. And that, it, that in itself is giving me so much satisfaction. So whether or not I reach that place that I don't know what it is right up until today, I feel that the success in the fact, is in the fact that I've started, like we said, maybe had the guts to, to take a leap and to see where it would take me. And I think um, just the fact that you see value and you see people using whatever you can bring to the table um this is rewarding enough and this could be a dream on its own regardless of where it ends and again a lot of times i've had to speak on stages and and to talk to you know younger entrepreneurs and to con have start conversations with people who are very very mature in business and i'd always feel like when i speak i don't speak from um, a perspective or like a corner of success. That's not where I'm coming from. I'm coming from trial. I'm trying something. And, and that's what I'm appreciating more every day. Um, and I think our definition of success is cued. So def success is like tick box. You've achieved that. And I think this needs to change. And we need to be able to talk to our children and to show them that success is not a number. It's not in hitting a specific goal, but it's in actually, you know, venturing into this path and then realizing maybe halfway through that it's not for you. That's also a success. Yeah. You know? Knowing what's not for you, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You process of elimination. Mm, definitely. Again, you took me back to the thing that Gary closed with uh, towards the end of our conversation. I said, I, I hope you one day own the New York Jets, which was oh. his dream for the longest time, this yes. NFL team. And he was like, thank you so much, brother, but it's also okay if I don't. Yeah, right. Because it, the, it was words to the effect of the thrill or the chase is all I need um, to, keep, to keep going. To keep me going. To keep running after that carrot or that rabbit or whatever. Like mm. it keeps me going. He's like, I don't, if I get it, it, it might you know, not be as celebratory as my mind is telling me that it is. Yeah. But the chase will keep me going and outgrowing my That's yesteryear self. That's the adrenaline, self. right? That's the adrenaline. That's the adrenaline. That is the exact word he hit on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I completely understand where that, that crazy? comes from. Mm. I think you need to be very much at peace with what you have to reach this sort of, you know, acceptance of whether or not it happens, it's, it's going to be good. Um, when, um, when we first started uh, Stuck as a platform, uh, we would get start conversations with key clients or big companies here in Saudi. Um, and I would be dying for us to close this deal. You know, I'm just thinking about it day in and day out because to me it was a measure of success. And I realized that the more I put weight onto that, the, 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 I don't know, the more I messed it up in a way, because I was constantly thinking of, of closing this deal. But when I started looking at things a bit more differently, like, it's okay, we know them, they know who we are. If we don't close today, we might close tomorrow. And surprisingly, this is what happened. <laughs> and it's just been really interesting to watch, you know, clients coming to you because they want to start working with you and all of a sudden something happens and it falls through or maybe they get really busy and you don't want to keep chasing as well, you know? So, but then they come back eventually with a much bigger deal. And, and that's when you start looking at things and you zoom out and you look at a situation from a, from a different perspective and you see the beauty of time 
and how it falls into place. Sure. You know, we wanted to do this conversation a long time ago. Two years and ago. Yeah, it's been a while. And and there's a reason why it didn't happen then. And there's a reason why it happened today. And I was thinking about that on my way today in the car. And I was like, interesting. If if the timing is today, then there's a reason why it's today. And, and can I tell you how much I enjoyed this episode? Thank you. Me too. That's been lovely. It's everything that I wanted this podcast to be, which is very little looking down at my notes and, and very much looking up at my guests. Thank you. And I love the the fact that we can have a conversation about things the way they are, you know, genuine without really having to over glorify things. And I think a lot of people, I'm, a, I'm the regular Joe, you know, I'm the person who came to Saudi not knowing what this would mean to them. And um, the other day, someone was asking me, what does Saudi mean to you? Or like, specifically Jeddah, what does Jeddah mean to you? And I just, I was just lost for words. It's home. Mm. But you know, it does not mean that Egypt is not home. Egypt is home the way your parents' house is your home. Yeah, the motherland. Yes, you, you have stories in every corner. Uh, you know exactly the angle that with which like the sunlight comes in through your window to sit on this specific chair where you sat and listened to music in your teenage years. You know the smell of the kitchen on a Friday morning when everybody's up making breakfast. That's home. But then you move out and you get married or you start a job somewhere and you start building another one. And that's a home of choice. And then you start seeing yourself grow and change and, and venture into experiences and fail and that's Saudi to me. It's it's everything that I've put together, me and my family, me and my husband together to create a home for ourselves. And it's very close to my heart. And if I can tell you how many uh, types of plants there are on the Corniche, I would be able to because it's it's how it's, that's how much this place means to me. You know, I can go around and travel and come back and this is home. So. If I had known 17 years ago that I'd be saying this, I would have told you. It's insane. But yeah, it's, it's very interesting how things have turned out. And I'm very, very grateful for that. And I'm very grateful to see the transformation that's going on in Saudi and to be witnessing it firsthand and to be living it as an entrepreneur, as someone who's been living here for so many years and to live the change day in and day out. And um, it's funny how um, you hear from people from other countries, the change is so fast, you know, like the pace. What are people waiting? What, what are people expecting for Saudi to wait for permission? Like what? Right. It's, right. it's fantastic. And they're doing it right because we're living it day in and day out, you know. Um, Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Because I'm sick of and sick and tired of hearing people saying that everything, everything's too quick. The great Kobe Bryant said that we have less time than we think. Um, we're doing great. And I, I see it when I go to conferences and when I talk to people who come from different countries mm -hmm. and the opportunity that is here and, and the growth that's happening. A lot of people do not believe it until they actually come. Yeah. But when they do, they're like, oh, my God, mm. it's, it's real. It's solid. They feel lied to all those years. Because it's what the media does in general. Isn't the media designed to do that? It just sheds light on specific things that they want portrayed, and then they don't shed light on other things they don't want portrayed. So it's always been a skewed image of any country. As long as you're outside of that country, the image you get of Egypt or the image you get of Saudi or of any other country is going to be very different to the one you experience Correct. if you're living there. And I think also Gary was talking about something similar to he that was, in his episode. He was. Uh, we keep going back to him. It was a fantastic one. Uh, but yes, um, so people who do come here and see the change, it is a solid change. And it's something that's super admirable. I mean, it's, it should go down in history pretty well. I think so. Yeah. 
Thank you, Asma. We could go another two hours, no problem. Thank you. This was <laughs> such a pleasure. I really Likewise. enjoyed it. Likewise. Thank you for all the work you guys do behind the scenes in, in getting our translation tip top. <laughs> I'm sure this episode is going to be no different. Um, Thank you. You might be a bit more hands on on this one. <laughs> I don't think I'll watch. I don't think I'll watch. <laughs> Appreciate you in so many Thank more you. ways than you know. And uh, let, this, let this not be the last time we Thank get on Thank you a, for having me. This was such podcast. a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much, all. Asma. Thank you. That was lovely. I felt very comfortable. Thank you for making me feel so comfortable.